Hello, and welcome to this clip going through one of the questions on uh, the June 2011 Cambridge Chemistry Challenge Lower 6 paper. Um, I would point out that this isn't a mark scheme, uh, it's literally just my interpretation of how to go through the questions. So as with any um, C3L6 paper, the thing to remember is what they give you in the box. So as you might expect, any paper with challenge in the name is meant to be quite hard. But if you can get your head past that fact, um, and accept there's a little bit of thinking and application required, it should be possible to, to deduce your way through it. So when they talk about um, an appropriate number of significant figures and giving the correct units, you need to give the correct unit conversions, and uh, when they talk about appropriate significant figures, they mean the least sensitive from the data in the question. So let's say the least sensitive number of significant figures is three, your answer should be two, three significant figures. Okay, so let's uh, crack on with the question. So before we do that, let's have a quick look at the periodic table that's provided with the paper. Every single um, Cambridge Chemistry Challenge paper will have a periodic table, and they might have values for a, a relative atomic mass, for example, that are slightly different from the ones that you're used to. It's not that it's incorrect, it's maybe to a slightly higher level of precision. Um, generally, the exam boards tend to use one decimal place, and as you can see from all of the values here, there are two decimal places. The calculations in the paper will expect you to use the values from this periodic table, not the ones from your own exam board. So let's say you happen to remember from your own exam board that chlorine is 35.5, and on this one it's clearly 35.45, you need to use 35.45 not the one from your exam board, which is probably 35.5. Okay, so let's have a look at question two from this paper. It gives you a little bit of information um, and back contextual background, uh, but then it starts talking about silicon and a compound Na2SiF6. And the first question, uh, part A, um, asks you about oxidation state and molecular shape. So like I said in my other clip that I did uh, going through question one, in this question from the same paper, um, it starts out with straightforward first-year A-level chemistry. So as always when doing oxidation states, you need to work out, uh, first of all, what the oxidation numbers are for the elements that fall within the oxidation number assignment rules. So in this case we can assign minus one to fluorine and plus one to sodium. So we can assume that um, sodium silicon hexafluoride is a neutral compound, so all the oxidation numbers must add up to zero overall. So we can work out what contribution each element makes. So in order for the whole thing to add up to zero, uh, silicon must have an oxidation number of plus four. Uh, I should point out really um, a couple of seconds ago that I said it was a molecule. Uh, I was a bit wrong to do that because obviously because it's got metals and non-metals in it, uh, you can assume that because it's crystalline, uh, it's going to be uh, ionic. And ionic compounds form giant ionic lattices. And within that you have what's called a formula unit rather than a molecule. You don't get molecules in ionic lattices. So my humble apologies for that one. Okay, so let's now move on to part II. So the next question asks us to consider the shape you'd expect for the anion contained in Na2SiF6. So the anion is obviously the negatively charged ion, as you'll remember from GCSE days. So in the SiF6 2 minus anion, you have one central atom and six atoms bonded to it, so it'll be octahedral. On a slight side note here, you may have worked out that there might be presence of a lone pair due to the fact that silicon has expanded its octet to accommodate six fluoride um, ions. But the 2 minus charge will also indicate two additional electrons. So although the exact bond angle you know, might not be exactly the same as the 90 degrees that you come across in textbooks. The, the shape is going to be broadly um, octahedral. 
Don't forget they're asking you what shape do you expect. So we're now onto some simple but fairly deductive chemistry. It's uh, worded in a similar way to many harder A-level questions. So you might come across questions like this in a natural A-level later on in your course. So you're given some clues as to what's happening and then asked to apply a little chemical common sense. So it tells you that on heating over to over 300 degrees C, the Na2SiF6 decomposes. In other words, it breaks up into uh, smaller molecules or formula units. So a white crystalline solid W is formed, and so is a colourless gas X. So your white crystalline solid might be an ionic salt of sodium, for example, such as sodium fluoride, and a colourless gas containing silicon might be a silicon tetrahalide. This might be a little harder to arrive at by deduction alone, but if you think about what you've got left over, once the sodium's out of the picture, all you can really do is think of silicon with some with uh, uh, four or five or six um, fluorines around it, perhaps. So, um, for the formula for W, what they want you to do is uh, just write out uh, an ionic equation, really. Just write out an ionic equation, a formula of an ionic compound. So, um, our ionic compound would be NaF, and our colourless gas X um, thinking about silicon as a group 4 element, it's the same in the same group as carbon. So carbon forms uh, gases such as methane. So silicon might form a gas such as silane, SiH4. So a tetrahedral structure uh, for our um, X would be SiF4. And the equation is easy enough to construct once you've got those two um, written down. So now it moves on to um, part C, and it uh, talks about the gas being passed through a series of centrifuges in order to enrich the silicon-28 isotope. And after that enrichment, it's uh, reacted with calcium hydride. So I just wanted to take you through a little bit about how calcium hydride. You might not have heard of the hydride um, ion. But think for a second about what the suffix "-ide", actually means. More common examples you might have come across uh, in your A-level studies, like sulfide, S2 minus, oxide, O2 minus, and nitride, N3 minus. It means the element without an extra oxygen, such as sulfate or nitrate, um, but it's got a, a negative charge, and that signifies extra electrons that it's gained. So a sulfide ion has gained two extra electrons, for example. So put in the reactants, um, which is your gas... Um, uh, which one was it? Uh, gas X and uh, your calcium hydride. It shouldn't be too difficult to work out what um, Y and Z are. Should it shouldn't be too difficult to work out the combustion equation for SiH4, like so. So now we can move on to part D. And on this one, they ask you for the thermal decomposition of Z saying that it uh, decomposes into solid silicon at temperatures around 800 degrees C. And the byproduct of the reaction is another colourless gas, which is flammable in there, but not spontaneously flammable. So hopefully that wasn't too difficult to work out, seeing as you were just breaking up the SiH4 into, into silicon and something else. The only thing, thing, thing that something else could be would be hydrogen. So let's now go on to the next page. So uh, this section introduces uh, a new idea, which is beyond A-level chemistry, uh, called unit cells, which uh, are basically a geometrical method of representing the smallest repeating arrangement of atoms or ions within a lattice. So as I've said in other um, walkthrough clips for C3L6 papers, when you suddenly get a large body of text, it means they're explaining something new to you. So it's always worth simply just putting the pen down and going into reading mode and having a little look through it before you continue. So you may wish to pause the clip, or if you've downloaded the, uh, the paper from the C3L6 website, uh, you can uh, have a look at it yourself. So let's start with uh, part E. What we need to do is to calculate a value for N, which is the number of silicon atoms per unit cell. 
So what I've tried to do, not very well I'm afraid, is recreate the diagram at the top. So, if we take A to be the length of one of the sides of the square, it's meant to be a square, I've drawn a very bad one, uh, you'll notice if we just take the corner atoms, an eighth of each corner atom sits within that cube. And before I embarrass myself even further with my poor drawing, let's just ask you if that's okay to visualise that the red parts are those slices, those eighths that sit within the actual cube. So that's eight times one eighth, isn't it? But we need to also remember the fact that there are some atoms that are on the faces. So let's do an atom on the face. And remembering, of course, that each of these red atoms, there's six in total, are only halfway inside the unit cell. So our formula for working out n is 8 times 1 eighth, which is the corner atoms, 6 times 1 half, which is the face atoms, plus 4 atoms that are already inside. Now I don't have room to put them in there without it starting to look a little crowded. It's not looking that fantastic as it is. But if you look at the better version that was printed on the paper, you can see where I'm coming from. So they now want us to give an expression for the number of atoms in the sphere in terms of A, N, and V. So A is expressed in picometers, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 12 uh, metres. So A cubed would be in uh, this uh, order of magnitude of metres cubed, which equals an uh, order of magnitude of times 10 to the minus 36 metres cubed. And the volume of the sphere that the crystal is cut into is v centimetres cubed, which equals 10 to the minus 6 metres cubed. And we want the atoms that are present in that particular volume. So the next thing to do is to work out an expression for the number of atoms present, including the units. So some of the units can be cancelled out, the m3, m to the power of 3 can, metres cubed, and the orders of magnitude can as well. And what that allows us to do is to multiply the whole thing by 10 to 30, which is what remains. Now, to work out the number of uh, atoms in 1 gram, remember that the mass of the sphere was m grams from the question. If you look just above the red square, you'll see what I mean. So by multiplying the denominator by m, you can scale it accordingly to work out the number of atoms in 1 gram. And to scale it accordingly from the number of atoms in the end one mole, in other words, the expression for the Avogadro constant, which is part iii of uh, section e, you multiply up the numerator this time, the top part of the expression, by the ar. And don't forget, of course, that both of those expressions in their entirety are multiplied up times the power of 10 to the 30 in each case. So now we can move on to part f. So, it tells us to consider the atoms within one of the smaller cubes, or otherwise. So if we look at uh, the corners, x, y, and z, but if we divide the unit cell into eight pieces as per the diagram on the paper, so one of the small squares, we can call each side a over 2. And there's a red atom sitting in the middle of this smaller cube. So now we can start thinking what the silicon-silicon bond length would be it's going to be yz for 2. So we need to do a little bit of Pythagoras theorem to work this out. So we start by looking at xy, which is the diagonal across the floor of that cube. So I'm going to put that in purple, little purple dotted line, and then uh, we can work out uh, using Pythagoras' theorem, uh, using the square of the hypotenuse is uh, equal to the square of uh, some, some of the squares of the other two sides. That gives us a squared over 2 squared plus a squared over 2 squared. Double that, that's a squared over 4 times 2. So xy is a over root 2. So using the same idea, yz squared is a over 2 squared plus a over root 2 squared. So to get yz, we can square root all of that, which can simplify 
to root 3 over 2a. But like we said a bit further up, yz is actually twice the bond length. So therefore, we have to divide root 3a by 4, not root 3a by 2. So let's go on to part g and h now. So using the mass times abundance over the total amount of all the abundances, the normal calculation for AR, we can slightly alter it using the information we've got. We've got the relative isotopic mass, and we've got the isotope. What we haven't got is the percentages, uh, the abundances in other words. So that can be changed round, um, which I'm going to do in a second, which gives us the isotopic fraction times the isotopic mass um, summed. So now we've got all of those um, uh, sort of put into expressions, we need to add them all up, which gives us 27.9769731. So for part 8, what we've got to do is go back to our original answer for part EIII, which looked like that. Now we've got values to put into it. So doing the numerator of the expression, the 8 comes from the uh, n that we had before. So I took 8 times an eighth plus 6 times a half plus 4 to give me 8. So this uh, gives us our expression with all the numbers put in. But if you remember, we had to multiply the whole thing up by 10 to the power of 30. So I'm just following up the 10 to the power of 30 in a second which gives us the Avogadro constant that uh, we all know and love. Okay, so hopefully you found this, uh, this walkthrough of the second quest question in the paper useful. Again, uh, you can see how it can get quite involved mathematically. Um, be prepared for this and make sure that your units are sort of nice and tidy and your sig figs are nice and tidy. If anything, give may maybe a few more sig figs than you need as opposed to a few less. Okay, for now, again, thanks for listening, and until next time, see you soon.